We will take our reading from St. Luke's Holy Gospel. And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, forgive me, and give me a portion of the substance that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his substance. And not many days after, the younger son, gathering all together, went abroad into a far country, and there wasted his substance, living riotously. And after he had spent all, there came a mighty famine in that country, and he began to be in want. And he went and cleaved to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his farm to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And returning to himself, he said, How many hired servants in my father's house abound with bread, and I here perish with hunger. I will arise, I will go to my father, and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am not worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And rising up, he came to his father, and when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and was moved with compassion, and running to him, fell upon his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am not worthy to be called thy son. And the father said to his servants, Bring forth quickly the first robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and make merry, because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again, was lost and is found. Again, those are words taken from St. Luke's Holy Gospel. The situation looked bleak. The Moors, those Muslim infidels, had invaded southern Spain and the Iberian Peninsula in the year 711 A.D. A wave of Islamic warriors gained victory at a major battle against the Christians. The Christian king, a man named Rodrigo, had been killed. And the Archbishop of Seville and his followers turned traitor, betraying their own people and the cause of Christ, and went on to fight for the Muslims. Again, things looked very bleak. But there was one man, one Christian nobleman named Don Paleo, who came on the scene and brought hope. Don Paleo led what remained of the Christian army, and they went to the northern tip of Spain, where they found refuge in the mountains, in the cliffs, and even in a very special cave known as Covadonga, also known as the Cavern of Our Lady or the Cave of St. Mary. As the Muslims took over nearly all of Spain, refugees would come to join Don Paleo at Covadonga. Here would be a Christian outpost, a Christian remnant where the fire of faith remained alive in the midst of an Islamic winter. Now, the Muslims were not interested in this northern mountainous region of Spain. In their minds, Spain had been conquered. It was all over. But at the same time, the Muslims did not want this rebellion and refusal to bow towards Mecca and Allah to infect other parts of Spain. And so in the year 722 A.D., the infidel marched towards the north, They had an army of highly equipped, specially trained soldiers, some 60,000 in number. And they went off to face a very small band of ill-equipped Christian soldiers. But Don Paleo and his followers had one main advantage, namely Our Lady of Covadonga. You see, Don Paleo had placed a statue of the Blessed Mother in a cave, and he and his men begged for her help and protection in the coming battle and that the Christian faith would be preserved. 
Don Peleo and a thousand of his best men would wait in that cave as the infidel approached. Yes, they were outnumbered 60 to 1, but the Christians were determined either to conquer the enemy or to perish in the fight. When the Muslims arrived, they sent that traitor, the former Archbishop of Seville, to negotiate a surrender, seeing how outnumbered the Christians were. This Judas with the mitre promised Don Peleo honors and riches if he would but raise the white flag and give up. But Don Peleo answered, You would now try to persuade us to bend our necks to the yoke of slavery, a fate far worse than death. No, Archbishop, we are determined to put an end to the evils we suffer, either by defeating the Moors or by giving up this miserable life for eternal happiness. The next morning at dawn, the Muslims advanced in battle formation. Muslim archers shot volleys of arrows towards that cave of Our Lady, but the arrows either bounced off the rocks above or even returned towards the Muslims below and killed them. Don Peleo and the Christians saw Our Lady's hand at work, and they began to throw rocks and parts of trees onto the Muslim hordes below. But then an even greater miracle occurred which demonstrated that our Lord is truly a mighty conqueror who stirs up his almighty power and comes to our aid. A terrible storm suddenly broke out. Thunder roared. Lightning hit the dark mountain slopes, and heavy rains caused mudslides that sent boulders and trees tumbling down the mountainside upon the Muslim troops below. Struggling in the mud, many Muslim soldiers slipped and fell into a flooding river nearby and were drowned. In short, Almighty God, through the all-powerful intercession of Our Lady of Covadonga, had made the mountain itself fall upon the soldiers of Muhammad. With this great victory, Don Peleo was named King of Spain, And the Reconquista, the centuries-long reconquering of Spain, would begin. Today, a great basilica rises upon the spot of that cave, and it's in honor of Our Lady of Covadonga. That was a miraculous battle. And at that holy site, the body of Don Peleo was laid to rest. The inscription upon his tomb reads in the following way. Here lies the holy king Don Peleo, who in this miraculous cave began the restoration of all Spain. Now it would take 770 years altogether. But after the battle of Covadonga, Spain would slowly but surely remove the infidel from their land. And so pure was the faith of the Spanish at that time that no heretic nor Judaizer would be finding welcome in the Iberian Peninsula. Now in the creed that we recite regularly, especially on Sundays, it says the following, For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, that he is the Son of God, and son of Mary, the true conqueror of Satan. More than 2,000 years ago, paganism and idolatry were the dominant religion in nearly every corner of the earth. Satan unjustly ruled as a tyrant over men, enslaving them in sin, error, and idolatry. But there was always a faithful remnant that held on to the one true faith children of Abraham, and they had an outpost in a place that was called the Holy Land. A world that lay in darkness would find one miraculous star shining brightly over a cave in Bethlehem. And from this city of David, from Bethlehem, known as the House of Bread, the great king of the Jews 
and ruler of the nations would deliver his people from bondage and bring true peace to men of goodwill. Now, such a conqueror to come had been prophesied. In the book of Wisdom, in the Old Testament, it states the following. For while all things were in quiet silence, and half spent was the night, midnight, thy almighty word leapt down from heaven from thy royal throne as a fierce conqueror into the midst of the land of destruction, unquote. Furthermore, even our Christmas carols speak of this great conqueror of the devil to come. For example, God rest ye merry gentlemen. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power. We were gone astray. O tidings of comfort and joy. And as for the tyrant, the unjust tyrant, Well, Satan's fall from the throne had also been prophesied. In the prophecy of Isaiah, we read, quote, How art thou fallen, O Lucifer? Thou said in thy heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. But then Isaiah adds, But yet thou, Lucifer, shalt be brought down to hell into the depth of the pit. But it should be noted that the prophecy of Isaiah also includes the fact that Lucifer fell to earth first and that he did wound the nations. We must go back to the beginning. Many answers are there. We must go back to the very fall of man. Adam's sin not only signaled a fall from grace, but it also brought about a change in masters. Now, God had originally created mankind as overseers and stewards of creation. The good Lord had given our first parents dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth on the earth. Adam and Eve were properly subject and submissive to the good Lord, and therefore all things were subject and under them. But with that original sin, Adam and Eve gave their obedience. They gave their allegiance over to the serpent. As St. Paul states in one of his letters, Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you obey? And our first parents, the human race became the servants and subjects of a new master. And Lucifer was quick to proclaim his unjust dominion. Satan became, as the scriptures tell us, Satan became the prince and ruler of this world, even the God of this world. He became the unjust Pharaoh, and we became his slaves, and we started to build his cities. After Adam's sin, Lucifer and his demons began to conquer kingdom after kingdom on earth, placing countless men in the darkness of error and idolatry. But there are always those remnants, little outposts who refuse to bow before idols and to serve this new master. Adam's son, Seth, the Bible tells us, kept the faith as well as many of his children who lived on the mountains to be closer to heaven. Enoch, the Bible tells us, would not submit to the rule of the devil And as a result, Enoch was taken away from this world without dying, and he walked with God. Noah obeyed the good Lord, and as a result, he and his family were saved from a worldwide flood through the wood of the ark. And yes, there was again Abraham and his children who would maintain an outpost in Canaan. Moses, holy Moses would lead this remnant back to the Holy Land after a time of exile in Egypt. And Joshua would then conquer that land as Yahweh's instrument. 
And even during times of great infidelity on the part of the Israelites, God always sent faithful prophets to call the Jews back all the way through the time of the Maccabees. The time was right. St. Paul writes to the Galatians, when the fullness of time had come at just the right time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. The time where the conqueror had drawn near. A conqueror far greater than Don Peleo came. The one who would accomplish the great reconquista. And again it began that little cave in Bethlehem. When the infant God came forth from the virgin, leaving her fully and physically intact. Shepherds would first come and submit to the ruler of the flock. Even kings would come and bow before their Lord. The conquering of Satan's unjust tyranny would continue with a mortal blow struck on Mount Calvary. And through his apostles and their spiritual children, the risen king would eventually conquer the entire Mediterranean world. After a number of centuries, Europe would be conquered for Christ. And with the age of exploration and discovery, Christ the King and the Virgin of Guadalupe would vanquish Satan in the New World. Eventually, Asia and Africa would fall more and more into the hands of Christ. And the Reconquista seemed so near. But then it happened. Like Judas and that Archbishop of Seville, Christ was betrayed, betrayed by his own. At the instigation of Satan, who never sleeps and never willfully surrenders an inch, Catholic countries, Christian countries, began a revolt against Christ the King and his holy church. Liberal revolutionaries rose up as the devil's instruments and wreaked such havoc upon the kingdom that we find Satan back on the throne today. The prince, ruler, and God of this world has seemingly reestablished his unjust tyranny as he rules the nations once again. And if you deny this, You must be blind. We abort our own children, contracept our future generations. We have the audacity and boldness to redefine the divine institution of matrimony. We make mammon, money, and idol to be worshipped by many. We remove religion itself from the public realm, a nativity scene being illegal. Most Catholics are revolutionists, and they fall prey to other errors of liberalism. Even more, the devil seems to have entered into the very membership of the church that Christ founded, as if he were enthroned. Pope Paul VI once stated, quote, The smoke of Satan has entered into the sanctuary. And Sister Lucia One of the visionaries at Fatima often spoke of a diabolical, demonic disorientation within the membership of the church. The recent synod of the family demonstrates just how disorientated and even dysfunctional we have become. As shepherds meant to protect the flock, seem to be leading the sheep even over the cliff. Now, in 1870, the disastrous Franco-Prussian War broke out, and St. Bernadette's convent was turned into a hospital where wounded French soldiers would be treated. Bishops and politicians approached St. Bernadette, pleading for her help, for her prayers, that she would help defend the fatherland with her sacrifices. Now, a rumor arose at this time 
that St. Bernadette was receiving new visions from Our Lady regarding this horrible Franco-Prussian war. Others felt that perhaps Our Lady of Lourdes may have given the visionary a secret during the apparitions about the invasion of France by Prussia. St. Bernadette was eventually interviewed by government officials regarding these matters. She quickly told them that no such messages were given to her at Lourdes or since then. Because she seemed so very calm and at peace, the particular interviewers asked her, aren't you afraid? Aren't you afraid of the enemy army? St. Bernadette said, no. No, she was not afraid of the Prussians, for God was in the midst of them too, and they were just doing their job in war. Then she added, they were but God's instruments in punishing France for its infidelity to Christ and the Catholic Church. But then Bernadette added that she feared just one thing, namely bad Catholics. Bad Catholics, that's all she was afraid of. That is, Catholics who did the work of the devil and betrayed the cause of Christ and Holy Church. Bad Catholics who had infiltrated and corrupted the membership of the church. This is what caused her true fear. And I would say the same things today if I were asked about the Muslims, the jihadists hurting us from the outside I'm far more concerned about infiltrators, modernists, liberals, and heretical Catholics seeking to destroy the church from the inside. Think of all those Catholic politicians who daily betray the gospel of life. Consider, too, those churchmen who would compromise on marriage and adapt to an impure and even sodomitical culture that surrounds us. It is bad Catholics, a fifth column within the mystical body of Christ, traitors who have done the greatest damage of all. What has happened to the Christian world? What has happened to the once Christian West especially? Judge Robert Bork, God rest his soul, became a Catholic before he died. Judge Robert Bork once wrote a book a few years back and called Slouching Towards Gomorrah, in which he described the moral decline in the Western world. The title, of course, pointed to one of those cities destroyed by God with fire and brimstone because of the unnatural vice committed by the inhabitants. But from the looks of things now, the title could easily be edited to read Racing Towards Gomorrah. The decline is coming faster than any one of us expected. The faithful few are perceived as being unenlightened, not being progressive, being backwards, unevolved. We're all, we're all on the wrong side of history. With this being the state of things in the modern world, many, many good Catholics long for a place of refuge, for a cave. And it's interesting how often restoration movements begin in caves. The Holy Bible tells us that David, the shepherd, David and his men remained in a cave to escape the clutches of the evil King Saul as they prepared to restore Israel with the tribe of Judah leading the way. During the time of the wicked king Ahab and his pagan wife Jezebel, the faithful prophets were hidden in caves in order to avoid extermination and prepare for a time of renewal. And yes, in the first and second books of the Maccabees, it was one family one family that was the instrument in saving all Israel from tyranny and also apostasy. But note that the father of this one family, Mattathias, and his holy sons, including the great Judas Maccabeus, 
began the work of restoration by first dwelling in caves. The pattern continued as our Lord and our Lady began the work of restoring and reconquering from caves, whether it was at Bethlehem or at Covadonga. But for this conference, I would suggest that there are caves or places of refuge for mankind out of which will come true restoration and renewal within your family, within the church, and within broken society. I'm not here tonight to make you and form you into chicken littles. Mentioning the idea of caves and times of trial to come is not meant to be an encouragement to you to build bunkers, to increase munitions, to move to Montana, or to store enough water in military MREs for months or years to come, or to become some kooky survivalist. That's not my point. Rather, it is meant to warn, warn you, to warn all of us, that a new dark ages is not only approaching, but is actually here as the sun sets upon a formerly Christian world. We need a cave, a place of restoration and renewal. And by the way, I'm not talking about the so-called modern man caves, huh? which allow a man to escape from his wife and children to some basement sanctuary or separate room where he can smoke a cigar, watch the NFL, maybe skip Holy Mass, and avoid praying the family rosary. No, this cave is a Catholic home, a truly Catholic home where the Sacred Heart is enthroned, a home which is like Bethlehem, a home like that of Nazareth where Jesus, Mary, and Joseph are present. A truly a domestic church. This place of refuge is a Catholic community or at least a morally healthy neighborhood. This cave is a good, strong parish staffed by good, prudent, and militant priests. It is a cave of prayer, a cave of virtue and true community life where the inhabitants are insulated, not isolated, but insulated from false teachings and moral pollution. Restoring all things in Christ will be hard work. It's going to cost an awful lot. It will make great demands upon us, and it will probably make us, in some cases, an object of criticism and attack. When you live the Christian faith, expect attacks. And this is why we need another place of refuge. A miraculous cave in this modern age, namely the cave at Masabiel, also known as the Grotto of Our Lady of Lords. If Covadonga was a cave where Our Lady gained victory for the Christians over the Muslims, then the Grotto at Lords will be the cave out of which will come victory over the modern, secular, irreligious, liberal, atheistic, and ungodly enemies, and yes, bad Catholics that surround us. She came at a particular time, the 19th century, the 1800s. It was a time of radical revolutionary change against Christ. It was the age of Napoleon, who would spread the evils of the French Revolution throughout all of Europe. It was a century of Charles Darwin and his evolutionary hoax. It was the age of Karl Marx, the Communist Manifesto, and the birth of Marxist socialism. It was both a rationalistic age that rejected faith and divine revelation and wanted reason alone. It was also a romantic age where feelings would guide us through life. It also was an age where science was seen as being the highest knowledge of all, that science could save us from all things. Sigmund Freud was also a man of the 19th century, and he practiced his wacky psychoanalysis 
or confessions on a couch and told his patients to never suppress their urges, but to be sexually liberated. Anti-clericalism arose during this time as priests were pushed out of the public realm. Church and state were separated, even divorced. And the Pope's own territory, the Papal States, were stolen from the Church of Rome by revolutionaries, leaving blessed Pius IX a prisoner in Vatican City. It was also a period in Germany of the culture war, known as the Kulterkampf, or the Iron Chancellor Bismarck. And the German government attempted to separate Catholic citizens from the Holy Father in Rome. And yes, it was an age of atheism, with the denial and rejection of the Creator and Savior. The 19th century that Our Lady came into was truly the new dark ages. It marked the end of Christendom and a true Christian culture. And it also prepared the way for the 20th century where there were two major world wars that cost tens of millions of lives, which included the annihilation of whole nations and literally the sin of genocide. But during this darkest of periods, Our Lady was present. The 19th century is the age of Our Lady. It's the age of Mary. A time when she visited chosen souls with messages that both warned mankind, yet also offered the greatest hope for mankind's healing. Know that the Lord is near. When Our Lady comes more and more, our Lord is near. She brought him in the first time. She will bring him in the second time. In 1830, Our Lady came to Paris to Rudebach and visited a religious sister named St. Catherine Labore. Like a child before her mother, St. Catherine Labore knelt before the Mother of God and placed her hands upon Our Lady's lap and listened. The religious sister received a vision of Our Lady standing atop of the world with her hands stretched out and rays of God's grace spilling forth from her, the rings on her fingers. Mary lamented that so many were unwilling to turn to her and receive healing and grace. And so the miraculous metal, the silver bullet was struck That was done to remind people to beg for God's grace through Our Lady, the mediatrix of all graces. In the same century, the Virgin would also come to La Salette, France, to visit a 14-year-old girl and an 11-year-old boy. During the entire apparition of Our Lady of La Salette, the Blessed Mother wept, often bent over with her face in her hands. This concerned mother warned of chastisements to come if men did not repent of their crimes, especially blasphemies and profaning the Lord's holy day of Sunday. And yes, in the latter half of the 19th century, Our Lady, along with her true husband, St. Joseph, and St. John the Evangelist would visit Ireland People of various ages saw the apparition of Our Lady of Knock. There were no words spoken, but Mary's silent presence alone would strengthen those who were enduring persecution. But this age of Mary would not be complete without her visit to St. Bernadette Subiru at Lourdes, France, beginning on February 11th, 1858. There were calls for penance, prayers for sinners, as well as a request that a chapel be built there and religious processions be held. And of course, Our Lady referred to herself as the Immaculate Conception, as the singular human person conceived in a womb without original sin. But at Lord's, Our Lady didn't cry at all. In fact, She often smiled at Bernadette 
and all the pilgrims that surrounded the visionary. On her ninth appearance at Lourdes, Our Lady directed Bernadette to move towards the corner of the cave. The visionary was then instructed to dig into the ground with her hands and to drink from the wondrous spring of cool, healing waters that would issue forth. To this day, to this day, the miraculous waters still flow forth in abundance. Whether they drink, wash, or fully bathe in the waters, both the sick and the healthy, the believer and the desperate unbeliever, the hopeful and those in despair beg for grace and divine assistance. More than 200 million pilgrims have visited Lourdes, that cave of Masabiel, and many have been restored in body, mind, and soul. They also come to this cave to find refuge, just as David did with his men, as well as the Maccabees of old and Don Paleo and his followers. From this cave of Lourdes, then restoration will come to this human race. You see, the men of the 19th century, the modern men of the 19th century, the enlightened men of the 19th century could not solve humanity's ills. Spiritual problems demand spiritual solutions. They were always trying to find material solutions for spiritual problems, which never work. Darwin and other scientists of that age were always lowering and degrading mankind, dogmatically pronouncing that we were made in the image of a beast. Man was just an upgraded chimp. But Our Lady saw things differently. Our Lady saw us all as made, as the, made in the image of God, in the image of Christ, perfect God and perfect man. She sought to lift us up to higher realms instead of lowering our dignity. Marx, Karl Marx, sought to build an atheistic worker's paradise with no hope of an afterlife. All he accomplished was making man's life a hell on earth in a failed system that has killed tens and tens and tens of millions of people. On the other hand, Our Lady of Lords sought to bring men to eternal paradise above after enduring this valley of tears here below. Sigmund Freud heard countless confessions on a couch, but he could never give absolution. He never granted healing. Despite seeing some patients for 30 or 40 years every single week, Freud never changed them for the better. He never liberated them, but kept them enslaved in their sin. Like Darwin and Marx, Freud was a charlatan, a pretender and a deceiver. But Our Lady, as the instrument of God, brought true miraculous healings to the sick and to the infirm. And the Holy Catholic Church, by the grace of God, continues to grant absolution and to remove guilt from the soul, thus restoring men to true mental and spiritual health. All the revolutionaries of the 19th century failed to make the world a better place. But if modern man would simply go to the grotto, if he would just embrace the way of Christ and the church, a civilization of truth and love would be formed that would truly renew the face of the earth. Now, to begin this conference, I read to you the parable from St. Luke's Gospel of the prodigal son. The story of the prodigal son who leaves his father's house with his share of the inheritance. As we know, the younger son lived a life of dissipation, debauchery. He wasted away his riches, a life filled with wine, women, and song, until he found himself living in a pigsty, eating a diet worse than that of beasts. 
This, dear people, is an image of modern man. Many men of the 19th century left the church and all the Christian inheritance they had, and they wasted it. And now, modern men today find themselves in a pigsty of moral corruption, eating the refuse of a culture of death that surrounds us. The bad tree of an earlier century produced the bad and poisonous fruits which we consume today. Sexual liberation, evolution, socialism, liberalism, skepticism, you name it, but perhaps the worst of all the bad fruit was that of atheism. The decay and stench of this fruit has spread to the point that this most foolish of systems, this most foolish of thoughts, is actually mainstream, even fashionable, especially amongst the younger generations. It's hip to be an infidel. It's now a fad to be an unbeliever. Militant atheists today write books that become bestsellers and appear regularly on college campuses with the hopes of creating more and more prodigal children who will leave their father's house. Send them off to university. Send them off to be enlightened or in darkened. According to a worldwide poll taken in 2012, 13 percent of the participants consider themselves atheists. France, the country of Saint Bernadette and countless other saints, reports that some 36 percent of its citizens label themselves as unbelievers. Now, the Holy Bible is clear, and common sense makes it clear that an atheist is a total fool. Being creatures or merely effects, we must have a creator or a first cause that made us all. In addition, since we are contingent beings, we're dependent beings depending upon others for our life and existence. I would not be here if it were not for my parents. If they had not met, I would have never been born. I am dependent upon my mom and dad. But you know what? My mom and dad are dependent upon their moms and dads, my grandparents. And my grandparents are dependent upon my great-grandparents. We're all dependent beings, dependent upon others. There's got to be one necessary being whose existence doesn't depend upon anybody else, or else the, the whole thing never starts. And yes, what about the design and the order of creation? It demands that there must be an original designer or orderer. Even little children know that beds don't make themselves up in the morning, and children's toys don't put themselves away at night. It is done by people, by intellects, who bring order to the situation. It doesn't happen by accident. Archbishop Fulton Sheen, perhaps the greatest preacher of the 20th century, Archbishop Fulton Sheen used to say that atheism, <laughs> atheism is the best proof that God exists. I mean, nobody talks more about God than those who deny he exists. The atheist is angry, angry at any mention of God by others. But he would be incapable of such anger if God were only a myth. Fulton Sheen once said, in only a way that he could put it, he said, there would never be vaccinations unless there were germs. There would never be prohibition of liquor unless there was liquor to prohibit. And there would never be atheism unless there were a God to destroy, dismiss, and atheate. As the great English journalist G.K. Chesterton once said, if there were no God, there would be no atheists. The atheist then is not a real thinker, but rather a defiant rebel 
who wishes that God did not exist. It's not an intellectual position at all. It's totally a position of the will. You see, atheism springs from man's desire not to have a God. Not to have a lawgiver so that he can break the law without punishment. Not to have a God of justice so that he can behave unjustly. Not to have a good God above so he can be bad here below. Not to recognize a heavenly father so that he can remain a prodigal son away from home. It is not religion, therefore, that is somehow the drug of the masses which keeps us stupid and unthinking. No, atheism is the drug. Atheism is the crutch for men who cannot bear the reality of a God who loves them infinitely and desires to be loved in return. Atheism, in fact, is the height of stupidity and it is the ultimate form of escaping reality. But all is not lost. For prodigal children can still convert and return to their father's house. The story of the prodigal son demonstrates the power of divine mercy and divine grace working in a rebellious, rebellious child of God. The bright light of grace eventually works on the prodigal son. The bright light of grace removed the darkness in the prodigal son, and it removed all those worldly illusions. The prodigal son finally woke up, and he reflected upon his sorry plight. While in the mud, while living with pigs, he asked, where am I? What have I done? Why am I so destitute, hungry, and impoverished? He then enters into himself, and he remembered just how happy he was in the innocence of his youth, and how much abundance his father presented to him in the home of his childhood. And so after reflecting and dealing with all the shame, the prodigal son courageously resolved to change his life. I will go to my father's house and say to him, Father, I have sinned. I am not worthy to be called thy son. Make me one of your servants. And arising, he went to his father. And he was rightly convinced that his father still loved him. The rebellious son realized that his tears, his sobbing, his heartfelt contrition would gain him forgiveness and pardon. And finally, there is true happiness experienced by the prodigal son. The father never forgot the son. The father thought of him unceasingly. So when the father saw his child at a distance, in such a sad and pitiful, wounded state, he had no anger at all. There was no indignation in the father. There was no, I told you so, with a condescending tone. No, the father was moved with mercy and compassion. And running, running, the Bible tells us the father fell upon the neck of his son and kissed him. The father gave the child no time to confess all his sins, but immediately commanded that a feast be prepared, for he who was lost has been found. I guarantee you here this evening, and I guarantee it, that many prodigal children in this modern age, by God's grace, will begin to look inward and they will see their sorry condition. The grace and mercy of God will bring them to repentance and will cause them to return home to the Catholic faith. There's going to be a restoration. There is going to be a restoration of mankind. Countless saints 
Countless saints have prophesied that there will be a renewal of the Catholic faith and a re-emergence of Christian culture once again. Do we trust what Our Lady said? Our Lady at Fatima said she promised to give us a certain age of peace. She cannot break a promise. She also said that in the end, her immaculate heart will triumph. She cannot tell a lie. But such promises of restoration and renewal, which will definitely come, must always begin in small ways within ourselves. As the old saying goes, if everyone simply swept their own houses, soon all the city would be clean. Restoration and renewal always begins with us as individuals. And from there, it begins to spread to others. And that is why I want to end this conference this evening by speaking of a last cave, namely the cave of the confessional. Many of the sick who come to Lourdes are not healed in body. Most cancer patients who bathe in the water of Lourdes emerge still having that dangerous condition. But everyone, everyone with even the smallest amount of sorrow, with even the smallest amount of desire to amend, will go to confession at Lourdes and they will be healed. There might be one miraculous bodily healing a month at Lourdes, but there are thousands of men each day healed in soul through the sacrament of penance. Your experience during this retreat will be lacking unless you seek to enter the cave or box in the back of the church. You have been provided with an examination of conscience that will allow you to reflect. Now you need to courageously arise and enter the confessional. The Father will be moved with mercy and he will welcome you home as his Son in Christ. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.